All right, I'm Paul Worley. I'm uh, head of A&R and Warner Brothers Nashville. A&R is well, artist and repertoire. So it's everything from, from find, you know, searching out and finding the great, the very best talent. So, uh, quite often recognizing talent early on before other people would perhaps notice it and then nurturing it and guiding it. And then the other side of it is the, is the songs, whether you encourage the artists to write the songs or co-write the songs or whether you just simply go to the songwriting community and go, this is what this artist is about, this is what they need to say, let's get some songs. So it's those two things. In country music, uh, many, many, many country uh, artists write their own songs and they always have. I mean, if you look at Johnny Cash or Merle Haggard or uh, Hank Williams, you know, the songwriting artist has been the mainstay of the business. Um, we also have the last great world-class songwriting community here. And uh, it's the last sort of Tin Pan Alley type situation. And, it, and so it affords our artists uh, access to great songwriting and great co-writing. Nashville, I mean, it's 10 square blocks. You know, on the light side, we'll, we, we call it high school with money. <laughs> and it really is. But yeah, we all do know each other. There are about 5,000 of us that work in this thing called the music industry in Nashville, and we all have our offices or our homes or our focal point in, in a 10 square block area. And it's, it's, there can't be anything like it anywhere else in the world. First and foremost, no, Nashville is not just a country music city. Uh, uh, the, first, the first worldwide superstar that came out of Nashville was the Fisk Jubilee Singers back at the end of the uh, 1800s. Worldwide stars. Uh, it was this black gospel choir from a, a small university uh, over across town. So uh, with that as our roots, uh, what people quite often miss is that we are music city, not country music city. Uh, having said that, country music is the dominant format that we feed, uh, and so that's why we, we, we are labeled the way we are. But we have all kinds of music uh, coming out of here and getting signed elsewhere and, and doing well uh, with other record companies. Country music is started out as music of the country, rural-based music. And what it has become today is this music of the country, the United States of America. Can you expand on that? What do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's music that reflects the, the values and the concerns and the melodies and the, and the grooves and styles of mainstream America, of, of people in, in everyday life. Country is a very wide genre. Uh, in fact, we have only one uh, radio outlet. We, we have this thing called country radio that is our format. Well, I was, I was driving around on my motorcycle listening to music, which is what I like to do, and uh, <clears throat> it occurred to me that country radio is, is really like an oldies format. They play so much traditional and recurrent music that, that uh, it, in a lot of cases when we're breaking a new act, it's like, it's like asking an oldies station to play Coldplay. You know, they're not going to do it because they, they've got 50 years or 60 years of, of oldies to play. And that's what they do. It's not quite that, that tight, but we have one radio format to service traditional country, um, um, old, you know, old, oldies, um, new you know, pop country, alt country, you know, every kind of country music you can think of squeezes through one format. And it's, so it's very difficult to get anything done. I think alt country is, is what we use to describe rootsy country music. And it can be rootsy in a, in a traditional country kind of way or rootsy in a, uh, uh, a roots rock, edgy, not highly polished kind of way. But with country songs at the, at the center of it all. I, I don't have a prejudice about what, what music ought to be or what country music ought to be. Uh, there's a lot of people in town that, are, that, that cry about uh, the murder of country music, that uh, someone's murdering Music Row. Uh, I suppose I'd be one of those because I think country music can be, should be as broad and wide and tall as it can be. And, and your audience, 
generally feels the same way, your demo? I, mean, I think people don't care about whether something is traditional country or pop or alt. or what, They just want it to be good, and they want it to resonate in some way with their life, whether it's to make them laugh or cry or think mm -hmm. or, or, get, or get pissed off or whatever, you know. I, I don't think that there's much difference from our music and other genres of music, and that it's just you find talent uh, wherever it emerges from and, and however it presents itself, and you nurture it and you bring it to the public. You know, everything from the Dixie Chicks to Alan Jackson to Keith Urban to, you know, uh, to Rascal Flatts. I mean, right there is, is a big, wide swath of music. And it's all country, and it's all valid, and, and, and it should always be that way. Uh, country music has been a hit-driven business uh, most of its uh, life. Um, but that's changing, and it, I think it's changing across the board. I mean... Nowadays, if you doesn't matter what genre you're in, but if you have a hit, people can go buy that hit for 99 cents. They can go get it for free, but if they want to be nice, they can buy it for 99 cents and have what they want. They don't have to spend 12 bucks or 15 bucks or even 8 bucks to buy an album. So, uh, I think everything is becoming a hit driven, but that doesn't necessarily mean that radio is the only way you get a hit. Um, but you know the 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 answer to that is you know you've got to make better albums. We all we've all got to make albums that compel people to want to own the whole thing in the sequence in which it's sequenced, sequenced with the information and art that come with it, the point of view, everything. You know we we've got to be we've got to put that whole thing together, uh, and it's got to be more than just a sack of songs. A lot of people come to us through publishers. In Nashville, the publishing community is is also an artist development community. So people come in, they they either sing demos for publishers and become known. You know, if, if I've heard a voice that I like on 10 or 12 or 15 demos over a couple year period of time, uh, I'm going to want to take a meeting with that singer and see what else is going on. Uh, it's it's Publishers also are a, an avenue where people can learn to be writer artists. And, hone, you know, they may be great singers and they want to write, but they need to hone their writing skills to, to get to the top. And so they do it in, in the publishing level. Um, uh, we have friends and neighbors and scouts and contacts all over the world, and they feed in, and we try to, to screen and listen to as much as we can. So, you know, two weeks ago I was in Colfax, California, outside of Sacramento, you know, listening to a a 14-year-old sing her heart out at a little movie theater in the middle of town. You know, the whole town showed up, all 1,700 of them. There was a banner, Colfax welcomes Warner Brothers Nashville. I mean, I, it was like it was like waiting for Guffman, you know. It was like being in a movie. It was great. And it, so we do all of those things to be A&R people. We probably lag a little bit behind uh, the rock and pop format and, and, and even, I don't know, rap and hip-hop, but we're aware of it. And, and we look at it. Uh, a lot of our artists use it. So when, when we have a young artist in development, we'll, we'll get started with a MySpace or with some of the other uh, internet opportunities to, for people to become aware. In fact, I, I, um, I'm looking at signing an act right now. We're trying to land a band, and they're really good. Uh, they can sit in a room and just knock you dead without a microphone. You know, so there's you, you have that going and they already have their songs and they sing great. And uh, what I thought, you know, if we sign them, I thought it'd be great to just go do that. Uh, film, film the whole album with one microphone and put that up on MySpace or something like that. Let people feel it and touch it and go, hey, this is the album. This is what we're going to record. Now watch us turn this into an album and then put cameras in the control room and have open access at you know, certain hours of the day. People can, can voyeur in and watch the guys make their album and maybe the guys have a little interaction time and, and actually talk to people and, and just start, you know, start, from, start marketing now because there's no reason not to. That's a great idea. You know, you can only do something like that if, if you've got an act that has the goods that has the songs, that, know, that can sing, that can perform. If most of the artists that we get, 
we have to help them hone those skills for a year or two or sometimes more before we get them to that level and then, and then start doing that. John and Kenny of, uh, of uh, Big and Rich developed a, uh, a group called the Music Mafia. And uh, the Music Mafia is, is very much a part of this label. They exist independent of this label, but they're, they're all around us. And, uh, and, and their criterion is you, you have to be able to hold, hold court by yourself. To be good enough, you, you by yourself, whether you're one person or two or three, have got to be able to get up and hold court and keep people tuned in and watching and listening. No bells, no whistles. That's the bar. And if you, if you can't do that, then you shouldn't be an artist. First and foremost, uh, you, you, you got to have a great voice, a compelling voice. It doesn't have to be, you know, classically trained. It doesn't have to be correct, but it's got to be right. You know, I mean, you are with Mick Jagger. Is, is, he, is his voice correct? No. But is it right? Hell yeah. Look at his career. So it, you've got to have that delivery vehicle that people tune into and go toward, not away from. Um, and then second, you know, you've got to have something to say. What makes a hit? Well, you tell me, and then you can, have, you can be the king of the world and own the one, the one record label. Um, you know, the, the good news about the music business is that there's not any one thing. There's not even just ten things. So there's a lot of ways to have hits and there's a lot of latitude. Uh, you know, but I, guys like me, you know, have to have a good batting average. Uh, and I think what enables me to have a good batting average is I can recognize a, a melody that's a hit melody. I can recognize and appreciate a lyric that's compelling to the ears. Uh, I can recognize a, a voice that has a tone about it, a tonality about it that will bring people in, not push them away. And I know something about wrapping music around those three elements that, that enhances the song and the voice and doesn't get in the way. Well, the, the opportunities for artists in the new media area are, are, are huge and they should be taken seriously. Um, and what the artist has to do, when, when an artist has made their own music in their garage, on their Pro Tools, for nothing, with their buddies, you know, they've got to, they've got to somehow objectify or find someone to help them objectify and, and listen to their music and compare it to what's up in the mainstream and decide whether it really competes or not, you know. And, and if it does, then, they, then you've got... Well, even if it doesn't, if, if it doesn't, then you have the option of saying, well, it doesn't really compete with what's going on now, but it's really good. I'm going to put it up and, and mark it myself, and I'm going to develop um, a scene. I'm going to develop a, a following, and, a, and uh, that becomes attractive to major labels when they look at trying to help you figure out how to record your second album. If you have made a piece of music that you think competes with major label music, then you have a tough choice to make because it's easy to th go to think I'm going to go get a major record deal and do all that. Well, you you know you need to take a hard look at what are you giving away to get, you know. And if you've got if you if you can keep yourself alive, if you've got a way to go, if you're gigging and you have a following and you can put your music up on your own website, and and it starts going. And you know you you make you're making good money and you you keep going and grow it, then when you go to make a deal with a major label, you've got a lot more clout and you you can make a deal that that makes a lot more sense for you, the artist, because you're not asking the, the label to spend the one to two million dollars that it's going to take to get you to that level. Mm -hmm. I'm a guitar player, and if you ask me what I am, I'll tell you I'm a guitar player. Uh, because I'm a guitar player, I just happen to have also fallen into being a session musician, a, uh, occasionally a songwriter, uh, a producer, an A&R guy, and a record executive. But that's all because I'm a guitar player. Uh, and I started doing that when I was 13. <clears throat> never looked back, never found anything else I loved to do more than that. Um, and it's still my guidepost is still the, the center of what I do. 
Okay, a guitar player's journey in the music business, however, is not as simple. Uh, so I graduated from Vanderbilt University with a, a, a bachelor's degree in philosophy. And uh, deciding not to move to uh, L.A. or New York, I was a blues player. So, but deciding that I really am a small town guy, I stayed in Nashville um, and came over here to this place called Music Row that I'd heard of, but I'd never actually been to. And um, got a job sweeping floors and making coffee for 50 bucks a week, six days a week, 10 hours a day. Uh, you know, waiting around for the inev inevitable, hey, can you, uh, can you sing? Yep, sure can. And then the next one, hey, <clears throat> can you play the guitar? Yep, I can do that. And one day it was, hey, can the engineer got sick and there's a session waiting on the floor. Can you engineer? Yep. Well, I couldn't, but they never knew. So, uh, you know, you do whatever you, 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 you do what you do, what you have to do to stay alive. And then in your spare time, you do what you want to do for free until somebody starts paying you to do it. That, that was, that's what ended up working out. So I, I ended up becoming a staff musician for that company. And, uh, we organized a rhythm section and then started marketing ourselves to songwriters and publishing companies and sound-alike companies and every, anybody that needed music done quickly, efficiently, and, and well. And uh, I worked in that kind of a mill for a long time until somebody, until Jim Ed Norman, who used to be the head of this company here, um, came along one day uh, and gave me and my buddies a chance to be his rhythm section. Uh, he had uh, a bunch of acts from the West Coast, uh, like uh, Mickey Gelly and Johnny Lee, and he had this thing called the Urban Cowboy Movement kind of under his wing, and we ended up playing on all those records. That was in the late 70s. And uh, from then on, it was just really a journey of being a session player, and helping my buddies out, my songwriter buddies would, I'd watch them sort of flail miserably in the studio and waste a ton of money and time. <clears throat> and it occurred to me that I could really help them organize their sessions and, uh, and get better tracks and, and, and make their, get their songs across. Some of those guys became artists, and as they became artists, it was comfortable for them to want to work uh, with me. And so, between that and people like Jim Ed, I was given a chance to, uh, to produce. And uh, so I produced for a number of years, uh, eventually then got a job as the head creative of a publishing company of, of Tree Music, which became CBS Music, which became Sony Music, which became Sony ATV, and uh, stayed, that put me in the Sony system. So I moved over to the record label as an A&R guy, um, sort of did some time there, then came back out, did, did the independent thing as a producer, and now I'm back at, at Warner Brothers. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's just a journey, you know, and, and you've really got to enjoy every step of it, because uh, you know, otherwise it's just a lot of pain for nothing, but uh, <clears throat> if you enjoy it and appreciate it, it's great. I can't imagine a better life than the, than the life of music. I, I look at all my friends that, you know, most people have jobs that they do for a paycheck. And then, they, and then their lives exist outside of their jobs. And, and in fact, as much as they, can, they, can, they try to avoid their jobs as much as possible in their lives because there's not much interaction there. Uh, my, my hobby is my life. My, my job is my hobby. I mean, I, it's all one thing. Um, how great is that? How, what, what price can you put on that? A producer is like a director of a movie. Um, so, you know, sometimes the producer's involved in finding the artist. Sometimes the producer gets a call from an A&R guy saying, hey, I got this artist, you know, let's get together, see if you're interested in working with him. Uh, once you decide you're interested, then you have to decide what the, what the sound design is going to be. What, what 
sound wrapped around this artist is going to represent who they are, where they're from, that's going to, is, is going to be commercially viable, or reach the goals that the artist and the A&R person want to reach. <clears throat> what engineers, what studios, uh, how do you work within, you know, what's the cost that you're allowed to, to make the album for and how do you deliver it within that? And then you're in charge of making all that stuff, of making all those decisions and making that come together. And at the end of it, coming out with a piece of art that represents not you, but the artist. I think it's important for a great producer. In fact, I insist that a producer does not have their own sound. And uh, <clears throat> when, when I first hit a lick back in the late 70s, as a producer, I thought I had it all figured out. I had a formula, it was working, I was hot. And so I banged out a bunch of albums, you know, only and, and quickly found out that that formula, you know, I can wear out my own formula pretty quickly. And then I'm no good to anybody. So uh, having learned that lesson, that what's kept me alive and viable all these years is never staying in one place, never. No, don't stay with the same engineers, don't stay at the same studios, work with different artists, find the new musicians, you know, constantly be curious about who are the new players and what do they have to give. Uh, listen to other people's records and, and steal as much as you can, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's the only way you keep fresh. And the bottom line is that there's no, there's no, W, there's no whirly in the W bin of the record uh, store. There isn't, there never, and there never will be. But each one of my artists has got their name and initials in there, and each one of them, I like to think each one of them has their own sound, even though they worked with me. You know, it's fair to, to talk about the differences between country music and the making of country music and, and other musical forms. Certainly we're different from, you know, rap, hip-hop, R&B, where a lot of it's done with machines and it's very much in the box and not a lot of, of real live playing, but a lot of sampled sounds and things put, put together. Uh, we don't do much of that. We, every now and then we incorporate those elements into uh, the rhythm section that, that we set around the, the music. But, um, but other than that, we're very similar to any, for, any of the other formats. Uh, I think everybody likes the same kind of, um, I think, I think the, the world of sound and of sonic performance is a very small world. You know, the globalization of sound is, is, is very tight. So we're all aware of the great sounding consoles, the great sounding microphones, gear, studios, recording techniques, and we share information quite a bit about that, genre to genre. So there's not much difference there. Um, there may be, uh, the, the, the biggest difference with country music is probably that we honor the song more than other formats.